Okay, so now it's time for the grisaille underpainting. And what that basically is, is a value scale underpainting for the whole piece. And what that is going to do is it's going to set up our greater value structure for the entire painting, which is kind of a huge part of the amount of work that's going to be done for the painting. This is really going to establish uh, the compositional shapes in a huge way because value is a massive part of the composition, um, you know, a, a larger part of the composition than just the drawing. So the painting should really start to look like something at the end of this stage. And uh, there are some artists that just kind of keep their paintings in this grisaille stage too and never take it any further. Um, but with that being said, uh, it's, it's basically just going to be a, a great tonalist value structure on here. We're just dealing with light and dark. We're not dealing with any color. Um, I will be using burnt umber still, but that's, you know, that's a brown. There are different ways to do this underpainting. Uh, traditionally, it's been done in reddish tones and greenish ton tones, as well as black and white tones. Uh, you can, you know, do more ogres and stuff like that too, but mostly it's keep this simple and keep it uh, based on value. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to use the burnt umber as well as my lead white. And the lead white, uh, what I didn't show you so far is that I have drained a bit of the oil out of the lead white as well. I threw in just a little, a tiny bit of liquid, maybe 10% liquid in order to speed up the drying time of it just a little. I wouldn't typically recommend that. Um, I just have to be doing it, doing it right now, but sticking with drier, uh, low oil content paints in this first layer is important. So that's what we're doing. This is plenty dry at this point. I've, uh, I've waited a couple of days or probably three or four days for that to be uh, pretty solidly dry. This is this, underdrawing paint is not coming off at all. So now is the time to really start the fun part. The fun part because I love to paint, to uh, push paint around. So, um, so let's get to it. All right, so I'm gonna show you a couple of different ways in which you can approach this grisaille. And I am going to paint this in a more um, opaque impasto-ish type of type of approach, um, but I'm going to show you another approach initially that deals um, with this really nice kind of simple wipeout technique. Um, these are, in my mind, kind of the two main ways that you can that you can do this. Uh, this underpainting or gris grisaille. Uh, one is they're they're both about establishing tones and values. Um, you know the value structure for the whole piece. Uh, you approach both of them in pretty much the same way, but the difference, the main difference, is what kind of texture you are building in in this grisaille stage. And I happen to like texture in my paintings. So what I am going to do is an approach that uses more texture, but I'm going to show you an approach that does not, um, so that you can sort of choose for yourself which one you would really like. And Right now I'm just getting my umber nice and set up. So the first thing I'm going to do with either technique is just start with a wash, which is just a thin, thin layer of paint and it goes over the whole surface of the paint. get this nice wash in here, just thin down with some solvent. 
And I'm going to spread this around the whole surface. And what I'm doing right now is I'm just covering. I'm not worrying about this being like perfectly beautiful. Um, I am worried really just about getting this paint on here kind of as quickly as possible so I can move on to really cool fun stuff. Uh, because this is, uh, this is, this is the busy work, this is the, the coverage part. So, just banging this in here. And you can see though that in my, the amount of paint that I have on, it's still not dripping. It is, uh, thinned down, obviously, with some solvent, but it is, it is definitely not super, super wet. Um, and the reason for that, I mean, you, you can do that sort of thing if you're really into that. I don't recommend that if you are a beginner because it's not really developing a very good surface to work on top of immediately. Uh, the paint drips and stuff like that look pretty cool. Um, I think they can definitely be overused in painting. But what... The, the issue they really pose for, for beginner painters is that they make the surface too wet and the surface is too slick and the brush doesn't really want to work on top of that or at least the, the paint doesn't want to stick to that stuff because it's just so slick. So you have to wait a while for that solvent to evaporate when you have paint that is thin enough to drip on there. So you have to wait for that stuff to evaporate uh, before you can, you can really start to uh, do any kind of substantial painting on top of it. So, I don't know, it just flew off my brush right there, but that's just the kind of, that's just the kind of uh, underpainter I am. Get it out, bang it out, move on to the cool stuff. So, um, don't try and finesse this part. All this stuff is going to be covered up anyway. Okay? So get it on there. Make sure it's not too thick or too thin. You can kind of see my consistency here. None of this is dripping. It's just on there. Now, you can definitely start to wipe some of this out. So here I have an old sock. A uh, really good technical tool here. And this old sock is just going to give me the ability to uh, wipe some of this out. So you can go around and um, adjust some of your values this way. You can wipe off some of the solvent this way too. If you really want to do that, if you really want this nice, smooth surface, you can wipe it all off like this. Or you don't really wipe it off that much. You kind of spread it around, but you see uh, a much, much more even type of tone here, much more subtle and more delicate. Um, but in this, this first technique, this is kind of how you would do the painting at this point. So I'm going to pose. I get myself into position here and I have you know kind of a lot of these lights and shadows already masked off and what I'm going to do is use this rag and you can use a, a, a good quality paper towel for this too I particularly like Viva paper towels because they are super absorbent and almost rag-like in their quality. So you can use a, a good quality paper towel that's not going to start to disintegrate at this stage also. But using like, you know, old t-shirts and stuff like that to wipe all of this out is um, you know, more than, more than enough. You probably have some, some old socks. You probably have a sock that doesn't have a match that you've been keeping around for a while, uh, hoping that that match will one day show up and 
I'm giving you the permission to take that sock and use that as a painting tool. So, so this is what we're doing. We're just, we're just kind of wiping this stuff out and this is starting to draw where those lights and shadows are. Now I'm also going to right now take a bit of paint on my brush. Unfortunately you can't see my palette here, but I'm taking some paint on my brush and I'm going to work my value structure just a little bit more here because that wipeout that I did for demonstration purposes was just a little bit too heavy. Um, a little too heavy for the values that I actually need here. So that's why I'm going back in. Definitely going into my hair, which is uh, nearly black. Very dark hair. And you can kind of see already that the value structure is starting to show itself a bit. And you can see, so right now my brush is actually dry. So I have blotted off my brush for, um, for this kind of reapplication of paint here. So this is a good and dry brush. And you see what kind of strokes that dry brush can make. can make some really cool strokes for getting hair. And you can obviously, um, you know, switch it up so you're using different size brushes and all that good stuff. I'm not going to dwell on this part too much because this is all kind of just demo stuff before I really get to the way that I actually want to paint this. Um, but you see you can really start to get some nice, some nice form in here. And this is kind of, you know, what, what you're going for at this stage. You're going for these good overall values, the, the separation of, of light and shadow value. You're starting to work some of those middle tones a little bit more. Um, but really you're going for these big value shapes and continuing to push the quality of your drawing. So let's get, let's see, this is a good dark area down here. And, you know, as, as you guys can probably see already, this is why you let your, your underdrawing dry for a couple of days, because as I'm putting this paint on, it's not lifting uh, really any, any paint off. It will lift off a little bit because paint that is thinned down with solvent, um, as much as that underdrawing was, like is not particularly well bonded to the surface. Um, so it can kind of be reactivated a little bit, but you're really, unless you're scrubbing the heck out of the thing, you're really not going to completely remove that paint. So that is, is basically going to stay on there. And you can also get in here and do a little bit of like finger painting and stuff like that too. So you can kind of adjust the edges here with your finger. Um, that's part of why I wear gloves, so I don't have to worry about um, getting paint on my fingers. Another thing that you can really do is to use a dry brush. I'm kind of I'm reaching for another brush right now. And I'm getting a dry brush. Kind of cleaning it off real quick. I'm going to get it as dry as I possibly can. Wiping it off with my paper towel. And this is going to help me manipulate some of these, some of these values and edges in a, a bit more of a sophisticated way than just what I would get with the, um, with the sock. You know, socks aren't that sophisticated at any, at any point, I guess. So let's get there. I'd like to have socks that just last more than a couple of years. All right. So, getting a little bit more of my value structure on here. You see how I can kind of 
move this around a little bit. I can kind of tease these edges. And now guys, this, this technique right now, this, this kind of like dry brushing type of technique, I kind of gave it away already, but the, the paint needs to be dry for this. If your paint is wet, you're going to end up with lots of like really cool streaky paint marks and stuff, but you're not going to be able to manipulate form with wet paint. So you see like this area that I just marked through, this area is a little bit wetter and it's fighting me just because of that. I'm going to try and take this dry brush here, which still is had to clean off some of the uh, the oil on it that was preserving it, so it's going to need to be dried a little bit over time here. But um, so you can kind of tease out these edges a little bit. And as this as this solvent starts to starts to evaporate, and as um, as it starts to evaporate out of my brushes as well, this surface surface will become more pliable over time. So I'll be able to get a bit more stuff going on. Um, a little by by stuff, I mean you know, values, I'll be able to get more values going on over time. Um, but still not, not doing bad even with what it is right now. So I'm going to make sure I stay in position here. Got a lot more hair going on today too, so that's uh, changing some of the stuff a little bit. All right. I am going to go for, I know I started this a little bit more clean shaven, but I'm going to go for a little bit scruffier of a look right now to, to better simulate the uh, effects of quarantine that I think we're all going through right now. Just trying to survive, trying to get through it. Great time to pick up painting <laughs> for, for uh, any of you who have been thinking about it. Not so sure, you can still order stuff and make it happen. So let's see. So you can go in and kind of use your dry brush. And I'm going to put down some of my stuff here. So I'm going to use my dry brush, get myself in position, and start to push this paint around a little bit more. I'm wiping off on the rag as I go. Wiping off again, making sure I'm not on a particularly solvent heavy part of this rag. And you can start to remove some of that paint in those areas and get get a bit more form with this um, with this wipeout technique. And you can also once again hit it with your trusted sock or old dirty shirt. And I got my finger in there. I'm gonna just kind of wipe that out a little bit. Let's see if I need to hit it again. I think I might need to hit this area right here for that form. And let's go ahead and hit that nose a little bit. So like I said, I am going to actually execute this painting in a different technique, but I wanted to kind of sit on this one for long enough that you guys can really get a decent feel for what's happening. Um, see, I'm starting to get some some good things going on in here. I'm going to go back to my br dry brush. I'm going to just kind of tease out these edges again. See, so I wiped it to get the bulk of that paint off, and now I'm taking the dry brush to finesse it. 
do the same thing over here too. Dry brush to finesse a little bit. Finesse that. And starting to get a little bit more, you know, a little bit more form happening here. Obviously the, this can, you can kind of push this stuff for a while. Um, which is actually, which is actually really fun. I've always kind of really enjoyed this wipeout technique because you get such quick results and satisfaction from it because of that, because you get such quick results. Um, kind of like glazing in that way. Glazing is something that I will, if you don't know, it's, um, applying a thin layer of paint and that is part of the demonstration that I will get to in another video. So just kind of pushing a bit more form. So this rag is to really remove the bulk of the paint and this dry brush is to really start to finesse the edges. So that's, that's kind of this uh, technique in a nutshell. You know, and you can, you can definitely push this. I'm going to just to kind of show you where this is going. I'm going to get another brush, another old beat up brush, which is all the brushes that I am grabbing for today. Um, which I actually kind of like, I, I do, I do really like the freshness of a new brush. But there's something about an old, worn, beat-up brush that I really like too. It makes it makes marks that that you don't always expect. Okay, so I hope you've started to understand uh, the different elements of this process. This, uh, you know, putting on the wash and then basically wiping out, and the different techniques that you can use to do that. Um, you know, in the different ways that you can, that you can start to build this form. Um, the form doesn't really need to be taken a whole lot further than it's being taken in this area right here, which is where I started to darken a little bit more, sort of get more form in the eye. Um, you know, got the, uh, you know, the definition of the light on the side of the head. Uh, most of the form in these lights is going to be built in the following layers, so you don't need to, like, really beat it to death right now. So um, kind of getting your your broader tones, your broader understanding of form is what you're really going for. So what I'm going to do next is to show a bit more of an impasto type technique, which is really just like, you know, a thicker paint application in order to build um, a thicker underpainting surface that you will then build on top of later. Okay, let's do it. Okay, so as you can see, I've done a little bit of wiping off here um, just to kind of reset this. I'm going to get rid of some of those darks, and now I'm going to jump into more of an impasto technique. So stay tuned. All right, so let's rock and roll here. So um, I don't know if you can notice in the video, but um, I am painting at night right now which is different than the time of day that I have been painting in. And I have uh, been, been curious about whether or not I wanted to do this at night because they would focus uh, a lot more on just the, the two light sources, the kind of the, the cool light source that's overhead and the warm light source that is uh, shining on the side of my my face here but during the day there is another light source and that's coming from all around because I have two skylights in here and I have two windows in here so there's a lot of light kind of cool um, daylight that is that is filtering into the shadow colors um, and the shadow values you know changing both color and color and value at the same time I'm wondering if I want that in the painting or not. Um, so I'm kind of experimenting at night right now to see which time of day I would prefer for this painting. 
Um, you don't typically want to go go back and forth. Um, you want to stick with one. Um, and I'm trying to decide which one I would like to stick with. So that's, um, you know, just, just the explanation of why I am now painting at a different time of day. Um, it's not because I advise it. It's uh, because I'm actually trying to experiment with, with what I want in this painting. So, so right now I'm just mixing up some good light values with this super dry white paint I have here. Keeping this super dry. Also, because this has had a couple hours um, to dry, the paint is not dry by any means, but it has had time to kind of tack up a little bit because the solvent has, um, has really evaporated from the surface. I don't know if it has evaporated 100%, but um, there's absolutely less solvent on it now than there was earlier today. So you see I'm using this big fat brush here and rule of thumb is always to start with your biggest brush first. I'm also using this brush because of the, the softness of its application. It's going to kind of drag across the surface uh, in, in a way that's going to create a bit of texture. It's partly just because the, the bristles are as long as they are. Um, it is going to it is, it is going to be softer in how it touches the surface, therefore the canvas texture will break up those brush strokes more um, than if this was a smaller, shorter hair brush. So, um, purposeful decision for a couple of reasons there. Um, a, lot of, a lot of painting is just about learning, you know, um, learning materials learning how you want to finesse these things. But, so as you can see right now, what I'm doing is I am getting in these light values. And this value, though it looks quite bright on the painting, is not close to pure white. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a shot of my palette I'll show you right now, but take my word for it that this is absolutely not pure white. Um, and I know that just because I, I took that white value and I mixed a bit of burnt umber in with it. It's making this, this really light kind of cool grayish color here. Grayish brown color. Um, and I am kind of just masking in these light areas right now, just the way I see them. So I am going to be dealing with some facial hair in this painting, but I'm not going to be focusing on it yet. I'm going to wait on that. Um, right now I'm looking at value, and I'm trying to look at value through... Um, through the facial hair shapes, just because um, the, the facial hair will be better painted later on. It will not be painted successfully right now, and it will be covered up anyway, so it's kind of, kind of a waste of my time, too, to do it right now. So, but for now, let's just work for a little bit.
kept this this underpainting fairly loose in terms of underpaintings uh, because I expect to build a, the surface of this painting a lot more over time. Um, if I if I really refined all of this stuff right now, it would sort of be a waste of my time because as I paint, I want to continue to to like I said, build this painting and to really build the thickness of the paint in the light areas especially. Um, there are other areas too, like there are probably some building in the shadows, possibly even a little bit back here. I don't really know yet. Um, I'm kind of going to let the process, um, you know, speak in, in that way so that I will discover things as I continue to go. Um, and that's part of why, a, a huge part of why I don't make a super refined underpainting. If I knew exactly how I wanted this to look, or at least I had an extremely good idea of how I wanted this to look at the very beginning, I could start a lot tighter. Um, if, I, if I wanted to work thinner in the paint overall, if I wanted to be more refined in the way the, the overall um, look of the painting is at the end, if I wanted to use less texture, in this painting, I could start with a much, much tighter underpainting. And therefore, this stage would take probably three or five times longer than it did um, for this. So that, you know, instead of being fairly loose in the form, I would have built a lot more of these lights and shadows in a much more refined way. Um, but seeing as I, I don't want to uh, start with something that is really refined because I want to search as I paint and I want to build Texture as I paint. There's no reason for me to put a ton of information in here right now um, Because I know that in the next stage, which is glazing It's going to start giving this color and then I will start to scumble on top of that Which means I will start to put thick opaque paint on top of that um, which is going to obliterate a lot of a lot of this paint here um, and eventually that won't be um, you know eventually I, I won't have to completely overpaint everything but um, for for this very beginning stage that's that's what's going to happen so a lot of this is going to be completely covered up which is why um, I'm letting the form be a little bit loose but with that being said, you can obviously see that there is still a lot of form happening. Um, there is still a lot of accuracy happening. There's just less information um, than there will be when this is um, when this is further along. There's less form overall, but the light and the shadow is still in the right place. And that's part of what's so important to understand is that my light and shadow is understood right now. Um, and you know I have these big shapes that are that are clear and will be broken down further um, as I as I develop the painting. Uh, another thing I want to address is the uh, the way I painted uh, this this shirt this this heavily patterned shirt here. It's actually the same way I painted the face. And it's a little bit difficult to understand that, but um, what I did with this is I started with a basic understanding of where light and shadow was. So I started to kind of kind of loosely define where those lights and shadows were, even though there's tons of value difference differences within this shape. And the reason I did that is to basically make a mental marker of of where those lights and shadows are so that I can um, properly develop the form as I go. Now, once again, I still kept that form a little bit loose because I know that in the glazing stage I'll be able to really define those shadows in a much clearer way. But, but even still, I started with those, those shadow shapes and then I moved into my big tones again, just like I did here on the face. I started with, you know, biggest, biggest shadow, biggest light shape, and then broke those down into smaller shapes. Did the exact same thing here, where I started off with much more of this value, because that is sort of the defining value of, you know, of a lot of these areas. 
So I started with that, and then, and then broke that down into smaller shapes. So then I started to put down the darker shapes, as well as kind of these middle shapes and the lighter shapes on top of that. And that is really um, a way of making sure that you're working wet into wet so that you can get the edges that you need in there. Um, but it's also a way of just of, of establishing the bigger value structure first. That's why you start with your biggest value shapes. Um, a key thing to note is that that large value shape that I started with was um, was not re a really heavy application of paint, okay? It was still opaque. I didn't thin it down at all with solvent, um, but I made sure that I wasn't really putting thick paint on there. It was kind of a scrub-in of paint. And a scrub-in is just what it sounds like. It's like you, you put paint on the brush and you scrub it around. You're not delicately painting it around, okay? Um, the scrubbing application is going to put down a thinner application of opaque paint than, um, than using the brush and kind of, kind of petting the surface um, and, and applying the, the paint a bit more boldly like that. So, um, so that gave me the ability to, uh, you know, to get the basic understanding of that value structure and then really start to make those refinements on top with paint that was just a little bit thicker, um, but not paint that really gets so thick that it's developing a bunch of unnecessary texture at this point. So, um, so that's really the approach I had with this shirt. You see, there was a lot of back and forth. I've never been able to paint pattern um, just super directly where it's like, you know, where I would just paint one shape and then just leave it and then paint the next shape next to it and so on and so forth. I always have to paint that shape and then paint the next shape into it and then refine um, that initial shape afterwards. So I always have to go back and forth because usually those shapes move a little bit as I'm studying the form and it's also a way to get the drawing a little bit more accurate and the edges more purposefully defined. Sometimes you need them a little softer, sometimes you need them a little bit sharper, and painting back and forth is, is really how that happens. So, um, and really the application of this, of this shirt is a little bit tighter than what's happening on the face, partly because I'm going to do less searching in the paint for the shirt. So as I continue to build this painting, what I have here is more what I expect to have towards the end. Obviously the color is going to change, but really a lot of my, my searching, a lot of my surface, my thickness and time is going to be developed in the face. The shirt is not going to be as important. So I actually started a little bit tighter on the shirt so that I don't have to do as much work later on. Um, because having a, a, a stronger underpainting, like I said before, will actually reduce the amount of work that you have to do later if you choose to do a, a really tight grisaille underpainting. So that's really the process for this. I'm going to now let this dry for a few days. Uh, as I've said before, I have a little bit of liquid mixing with the paint, a, a small amount, and that is speeding the drying time. Uh, in fact, I was, you know, these places, uh, amounts of paint on the face and the background are actually dry to the touch right now because they were able to dry overnight. Um, this obviously is still wet, but that will probably be dry to the touch tomorrow, and then I'll give it a couple more days uh, before I put another paint application on it just to make sure that it is pretty solidly dry by then. So I'm going to wait for it and then I'll be back with the next stage, which is glazing. And this is where uh, a lot of the color really starts to happen. This is in, you know, in my mind where, where stuff starts to get really exciting. So glazing is going to be fun. We're going to start really putting a lot of color into this 
and this painting is going to change pretty dramatically in a, in a really short period of time. So stay tuned.